It is a privilege for me to be able to share God's word this afternoon. It is a, a weighty privilege at that because the, the topic that we're going to be looking at is sensitive, clearly. We need to approach the topic with, with wisdom. I don't set out intentionally to offend or to shock. I definitely don't want to be unnecessarily crude or come across as being vulgar, but it is a topic that has to be addressed. We can't ignore. It has to be seriously considered what the Bible says about topics such as sex. We've said it before and we'll continue to say it that at the Trinity Church we go through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so that we can't skirt around awkward passages that might make us feel a bit uncomfortable. I mean, I have to preach this. So if it, it makes me uncomfortable in some ways as well. We don't just want to pick and choose and decide which is the easiest passage, which is comfortable, which will make us feel best. We want to teach the full counsel of God. And one of the reasons that we do put out to the church, obviously you can follow our, um, our series. It's, it's quite evident because we go verse by verse and chapter by chapter, you know where we're going to be up to next. But we also put it out to the church so that the church knows what's coming next. So that you can be preparing your hearts, you can be reading the passage in advance, prayerfully considering what is to come. But another reason for that is because there are now young people in here who are of high school age. And it gives the opportunity for the parents to prepare their hearts <clears throat> for what is to come. I have an opinion on this, and it is good to see so many sat with us. I have an opinion about keeping our young people in the sermon. And my opinion is this. If you send your kids to school, you should have no issue at all with allowing them to stay in a sermon such as this. Because you can guarantee with absolute certainty that the world is incredibly forthright at discipling your children about sex. They're talking about it all the time. They're having images thrust in their faces on screens. Their teachers are telling them what they should and shouldn't experiment about. The friends are talking about it and putting pressure on them. We all know we've all been to school. We should desire our children, our young people, to have a biblical understanding of relationships, of dating, of marriage, not covering their ears and mollycoddling and pretending everything's going to be okay. And I know it's a big decision and I don't want to come across as, as flippant when I say that, but it is so important. The church should not shy away from this and we're not going to. No matter how uncomfortable it is, and it may well be. But I just wanted to say that at the very beginning as an introduction. <laughs> Maybe a slap across the face introduction, but it's an introduction nonetheless. Last week, Nathan talked us through several reasons why it matters what you do with your body. If you haven't listened to the sermon, it was the closing of chapter 6. It's on our YouTube channel for you to catch up on if you want to. But here in this text this afternoon, we're going to be looking at another reason why what you do with your body matters. If you remember back, for those of you that have been with us for a, a number of weeks, you'll remember back to the introduction to, the, uh, to this series, the 1 Corinthians series. We learned that there'd been several letters, at least four letters that had been written from the church in Corinth to the Apostle Paul. Two of them we have remaining in First and Second Corinthians, and two of them are lost. We don't know what was said. We can only make educated guesses, I suppose, or come to educated conclusions on that. So Paul, what, he, what Paul is doing here at the beginning of chapter 7 is he's switching his focus. He spent the last six chapters my opinion, he spent the last six chapters covering all of the issues that were raised by Chloe's people. If you remember back in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Chloe's people brought a report to Paul about the state of the church. 
And he's just methodically worked his way through the last six verses, six chapters, unpacking it all. And here in chapter 7, Paul is now responding to a letter that has been sent by folk in the church. He starts it with, in verse 1, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. He's changing his focus. The same language is used in chapter 8. Now concerning, your, uh, now, now concerning food offered to idols. He's methodically going to work through the points raised in this letter. This is the context which we approach chapter 7. This is the framework which we approach it with. Paul is clearly responding to issues raised, questions asked within a lost letter. And if you remember, last week we were told that there were two specific groups of people in society, not just in Corinth, but everywhere within the culture of the day. There were two specific groups of people, and these people had also filtered into the church. You had the antinomian viewpoint, which is essentially translated as against law. These were the people that would say, don't you dare tell me what I do with my body. I am free from any restrictions, and I can do what I please with who I please. And this had filtered into the church, seemingly to the point where people were maybe even saying, I'm free in Christ. Whereas Paul would say, should we continue sinning so that grace may abound? These people were probably saying, I'm going to continue sinning so that grace may abound. Don't tell me what I can and can't do with my body. And then the polar opposite to those people with with those with the ascetic view. The word there means training or exercise. And these are people who would deny their body of any pleasures that they could even down to the food that they ate. They believed that the body was to be beaten into submission, maybe even physically. It should have no pleasure at all. It must be trained. So you had two completely polarized views within the church. It seems clear to me, though, again, just to frame this this chapter, I suppose, it seems clear to me that it's those of the ascetic view that are writing the letter that we've lost, which is why Paul is writing in the way that he's writing. People who thought that they should enforce chastity upon themselves, they'd never been married, they were single, and they'd already decided that they were going to deprive their bodies, they were never going to have any sexual relationships. Those who were in marriage, who maybe had changed their view whilst they were married, had then decided they were going to have complete abstinence. They were no longer going to engage in sexual relationships. Maybe even just one person in that marriage had made that decision for the marriage. You can almost imagine the way that these people, because they were living almost monastic lifestyles, we would say legalism, wouldn't we, in so many ways to the ultra on this one. You can almost imagine them looking at others within the church and saying, I'm so much better than them. I don't do that. Look at what I do with my body. Look at how I can control myself. Look at how disciplined I am. As they look down on others, all those wild people, Paul here is going to set them straight. He's going to warn them of the dangers that they face by living this out. But notice what Paul says after he references the letter that was written. He says, it is good For a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. What a strange way to start it if he's going to set them straight. See, the ESV does, does some translation work for us here. And it actually tells us the, the context of what Paul is saying. Whereas the original text wouldn't say sexual relations. The original text would say it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Which would mean hold fast or adhere to. Some translations would say kindle or set on fire. So the ESV has translated it for us here in context. It's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Why is he saying this? Personally, I believe, my viewpoint, if you like, on this is that Paul is conceding ever so slightly here to them. 
Like when you have a conversation and you say, yeah, I see your point. Or I understand you, I get you, I get where you're coming from. There's some concession if you remember Paul's own calling and how he himself lives his life. And again, we'll explore this more throughout chapter 7. There's a lot more to come on things like this. He's conceding in some way. Yeah, yeah, I can see your point. These people must have written to him and said, surely it is better to have no sexual relations, etc., etc., in their aesthetic, ascetic view on life. But Paul is absolutely not pro-celibacy, as in fiercely pro-celibacy. He's not against marriage, as we're going to see. I think Paul is saying it's to be commended if you're called not to marry. He's not saying it's a command to marry. He's saying it's wise for many to marry. Wise for the majority, perhaps. And if you do marry, it's essential that you have sexual intimacy. Singleness is good. Singleness is fine, is the heart of Paul here. If it's not the cause of persistent sexual sin and temptation. Verse 2, he says it, doesn't he? But because, it's already happening, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Paul puts a heavy caveat in place here. Yeah, for the sake of the gospel, there may be grounds for never marrying, never having sexual relations with a woman. But because of the sinful nature of people, because of the constant temptations surrounding, and even within our own hearts, the the draw to sexual sin, we should marry. The term that Paul uses there, sexual immorality, is fornication. Sexual activity outside of marriage for those who have never been married. So Paul is noting clearly that there is an issue. These people think they are strong enough. They've decided their path. They can discipline themselves. They can abstain. It's the right thing to do, but they can't. They aren't doing, and they won't be able to continue to. As we've already looked at in the last six chapters, it's a mess. They can't do it. They're not doing it. So Paul is going to set things straight. Talking to those that are married and not being sexually intimate. He's going to show them why they should have sex. Why it is good. In verse 26 of chapter 7, Paul uses the phrase, "...in light of the present distress." Now, there are many thoughts on what this could be. I'm going to take it in the context of what we've already looked at. I'm fully prepared for it to be something different. I don't think it's a necessarily massive issue as such, but I feel the context that's put on this, in light of the present distresses, Paul is considering the state of the world around him, the state of the culture. It's an absolute mess. The way they live out this hedonism, their sexuality, How the sexual, immor- the sexual immorality is just rife outside and inside the church. It distresses him massively. It distresses him when portions of the church decide to polarize, one living completely liberal as they please and one living monastically. Both single people and married people What we need to remind ourselves is and be aware of is that sex has been corrupted by Satan. Sex is corrupted by the world. What is offered is a counterfeit. Have sex whenever you want, 
with whoever you want, without consequence. Take as you please, use somebody, discard of them, and move on to the next. Take, take, take. It's your body. Do as you please. We hear it so often, don't we? It's a lie. It's a counterfeit. Counterfeits enslave. Counterfeits lead to destruction. Whereas what God offers, which is sexual unity within a lifelong committed marriage between one man and one woman, is genuine. It's freeing, it's life-giving, it's good. So Paul's conclusion that he comes to in his own heart as he writes this is that these people should marry. (coughs) Excuse me. Not just to have sex, of course. It would be wrong of us to take one scripture and say, oh, Paul says we should all, if we want to have sex, we better get married. It would be wrong of us to take one scripture and ignore every other. Take it out of context. We need the full counsel of God as we've already talked about. So before we do go any further, I just want to take a, a look, a brief look at marriage itself. What is it? Why is it to be treasured? Why is it that we should defend it? What is biblical marriage? Because just like me, you will have heard, oh, so many times, I don't need a piece of paper to tell someone that I love them. Why should I get married? Or if they do get married, they see it as purely an opportunity for a party. And they almost bankrupt themselves in doing so. As they spend a fortune on this thing where It really doesn't mean anything to them. God's design for marriage is, as I said, one man, one woman, in a covenant promise to cherish, to love, to honor, to respect, and to serve each other for God's glory. Vows are made publicly and before God to do so. God installed marriage from the beginning. If you think of Genesis chapter 2, when Eve was formed from Adam's side, and in verse 24 we read, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast. There's that language again that we're coming up with. Hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The principle of two individuals leaving and cleaving leaving their family home, joining together in unity and starting their own family. In unity as one. Jesus himself talks about it in Matthew 19 from verse 3. We read this. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. It is a lifelong union. Until death do you part. Jesus is clear on this. God installed and established marriage. God gave us sex. Not purely to just procreate. God gave us sex to enjoy within this union. Within this committed, lifelong covenant promise. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, 
and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. But we read in Proverbs chapter 5, and verse 18. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely dear, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Nothing to cringe about. It's a love letter. <clears throat> As we read through the Song of Solomon... We see the perspective of the husband and then we hear the response of the wife as they pursue each other and <clears throat> delight in each other. And in Song of Solomon chapter 6, we read this from the husband's perspective, how beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree and your breasts are like clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. And then the wife responds, it goes down smoothly for my beloved, gliding over lips and teeth. I am my, beloved, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved. Let us go out into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom, there I will give you my love. Mutual love and affection and enjoying of one another. Enjoying each other's bodies. I'm sure none of you are surprised where I'm going to go next. You knew it was coming. It has to happen. Ephesians 5. And I want to read from verse 22 to verse 33. Feel free to turn there or I'll just read and you can check for yourselves. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Radical words in a culture where women had very little rights, where men divorced their wives for no reason. Moved on to the next, leaving the woman without home, without provision, without social status. Paul's raising the bar. God is raising the bar. It's his standard, isn't it? But in verse 32 and 33 of Ephesians 5, marriage is likened to Christ and the church. For those of you that were with us in the Ephesians series that we did last year, mystery is mentioned. It's a mystery. And not a mystery for us to fathom with our oh so great intellect. Here's a puzzle for us to figure out. 
It's an unfathomable mystery. And it was for thousands of years for people who lived under the law, wondering how God would redeem a people. Who would be the Messiah? How would he save? A completely unfathomable mystery until Jesus came. And now we have Christ. And it makes sense to those of us to whom he has been revealed. We have a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So why one man and one woman covenanted together for life? Well, Jesus gave himself. He freely gave his life for his people, for his bride. Jesus took on flesh. He walked as we do. He felt as we feel pain, sadness, fear, hunger, rejection. He didn't choose his own comfort. He didn't choose his own path. He surrendered his life. He went all the way to the cross. He didn't choose the easy route. He surrendered for his bride, for his people. In Revelation 19, the vision that the Apostle John had, we read from verse 6, and it's a wonderful, wonderful scripture. It should thrill our hearts when we read this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! For the Lord, our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. One day, Jesus will claim his bride. And it will be a vast multitude of people, innumerable. One bride, one groom, one Lord, one people, forever. One man. One woman covenanted together forever. It's under the covenant promise that was made that God Himself declared that He shall have for Himself a people that are His. And in this new covenant, because we look back and we the mystery is revealed in Christ. We have a promise too, don't we, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To repent and to believe in Jesus, the only begotten Son. Repent, believe, be baptized. This is the command. And he will keep his bride forever. It isn't like Jesus says, do you know what, I'm a bit sick of you now. I know I promised, I know I covenanted with you, but... Moving on to the next. He keeps you safe forever. You belong to him. If you belong to him, he keeps you forever. It's truly wonderful. So for the Christian, just as for the Jews, they were supposed to model the goodness and the grace of God. How kind he is as they lived out obedience to him and they flourished and the world around should have looked at them and said, wow, their God reigns, their God's alive, we want in. And obviously they were so unfaithful just as we are today. Christians, it's the same for us. Live your biblical marriage for the world to see. Mirror the great covenant promise that we have in Jesus that we belong to him and we belong to him forever. Show them the better way.
Let's get back to, we could go on and on, I know. Let's go back to the text in verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. Here's the explanation of the point mentioned right at the beginning. Here's why it matters what you do with your body, because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your your wife. It belongs to your husband. Again, for, for, for women, as this was written, and maybe even today, it's so liberating because the idea of men having authority, the husband having authority over their bodies was, was nothing new. But for them to be told that they also have equal authority over their husband's body, that they have rights, that they can claim, that they should be satisfied sexually. Whoa, this is incredible. But notice the emphasis here in these verses on giving and not getting. Please notice that emphasis. Because if we were to have taken Paul out of context earlier, forgetting scriptures like Ephesians 5, we'd probably think it was okay to get married purely because you wanted to have sex. Forget self-control, I'll just get married. But marriage is a safeguard for us to engage in sexual intimacy. Because we are never, we're never more emotionally connected or more vulnerable than at that time. In the God-ordained, God-given, biblical marriage, we strive to honor each other. To love each other. To consider each other highly. To serve and to enjoy serving. As we have been so served by Jesus. R.C. Sproul puts it this way. He says, God is saying to both the man and the woman that it is safe to give oneself to the other. Only when there is a certain knowledge of a lifelong commitment behind it. What you have is so precious. You don't just give it away. It belongs to your husband or your wife. Even if you're not married now, it belongs to them. Give your body to the other. Paul wants them to know that they should be having sex within marriage, regular sex within marriage, that it's essential for the marriage. It's good and it's right. Give your body to the other. Don't abuse. Don't demand and bully. Don't manipulate and force. Never use sex as a weapon. You said this, so I'm not doing this. You didn't do that, so I'm not doing this. Don't threaten to withhold as if you have power over your own body. It's not honoring to each other. It's not honoring to God. And it's not mirroring the biblical marriage, the great covenant that we should be showing. Don't overly expect either. Don't assume what is absolutely essential within your marriage is communication. Clear communication. Regular communication. And always the communication that's putting the other first as you seek to serve them. Genesis 1, 27, right at creation. We're told that God created man and woman in his own image. If you are married, you are married to an image bearer of a holy, living God. 
You should cherish your spouse. And love them dearly. And honor them. And treat them with dignity at all times. They're not a commodity for you to use. And the submission that is mentioned in Ephesians 5, wives, is not just nodding and smiling, agreeing with everything, and just surrendering your body. Your husband is to love you like Christ loved the church. Your husband is to lay his life down for yours. In other words, he is to submit more. He is to lead you and to serve you and to woo you and to make you safe and provide for you. Your husband has to make you feel cherished. Not just so that you feel he just wants to have sex with you. Of course he should want to have sex with you, but... You feel he's just using you for that. In marriage, you are to yield to each other. You are to yield to each other. And you're supposed to seek unity at all times. Another thing that submission isn't, and this isn't just to the wives, another thing that submission isn't is sending subliminal messages. Remaining in control and being sarcastic or passively aggressive as you moan about the lack of intimacy. It isn't manipulating the other person. Guilting them into things. Bribing them, deceiving them, lying to them to get your way. It's not submission to one another. But do not withhold your body. Enjoy sexual intimacy. And this is what Paul is saying. It's God-given. It's essential for your marriage to thrive. God commands you to have sex if you are married. Christians, God commands you to have sex in your marriage. It's needed for the husband and for the wife. It obviously increases the intimacy. It increases the trust. The bond between you is strengthened. But do it to serve. It isn't transactional. It is service. Sex at its core is service. And I know that's completely opposite to what the world will preach, which is why we need to be teaching our children. It's completely the opposite to what the world tells them. Married couples must be intentional in their devotion to the Lord and to each other. Intentional. You have to cultivate your relationship. I used to be a gardener for many years. We have gardeners amongst us. And any of you will know who has a garden, has ever worked in a garden, or knows anything. If you were to turn up and the garden was a complete mess and you spent a whole day cutting the grass and maybe you fed the lawn and you cleared all the flower beds out, removed all the weeds and trimmed all of the, the shrubs and it's the, the summertime and, and you leave, you're not thinking that's going to stay the same. If you come back in a month and we've had a bit of rain and a bit of sun, the grass is long, the weeds have grown, the shrubs need cutting again, you have to continually cultivate your garden. You have to continually cultivate your relationship with your husband or your wife. Husbands, pursue your wife's heart. Date your wife. Wives, let your husband do so. Don't nitpick at him. Allow him. But be intentional. Please consider how you can be, content, be intentional in your marriage. I don't even necessarily mean it explicitly about sex at this point. I just mean in terms of cultivating your relationship together. Maybe 
something that would be helpful. It's something that's helped us in our marriages going to bed at the same time. It's helpful. In so many different ways. I'm just thankful that Jen don't go to bed at like 8 a.m. At 8 a.m. 8 p.m. <laughs> or 8 a.m. But be aware of each other in regular, constant, good communication. Talk about sex. Talk about expectations. Talk. Don't assume, as I said, you're partners. You are two individuals that have come together as one. Again, just talking about cultivating your relationship. Make your home fun. Have fun together. It's so important. It just builds such a relationship and such strength and unity. Have fun. Just have a fun home. Serve one another. Love one another. Have fun together. Cherish each other. Be intentional. It's truly a wonderful thing. So Paul wants the believers here to stop depriving each other and to serve each other with their bodies, their sexual relationships, within marriage, of course. So the moral high ground that these people thought they were taking, which we all like to take every now and again, if we're honest, it wasn't honoring to God and it wasn't good for their marriage. The moral high ground that they thought they were taking by enforcing this chastity or maybe declaring themselves to never get married. It was unwise and it led to sexual sin anyway, as we've already seen in the first six chapters. Verse five of chapter seven, Paul says, do not deprive one another. Or you could word it in a, in a different way, do not rob one another. Your body's not your own, it belongs to your spouse. Don't make your own decision according to what you think is best for you. And that's it. Decision made. Like it or lump it. You are one. Do not deprive one another except perhaps, in capital letters I think, should be, by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I think we have another concession here from Paul. Yeah, I can see your point. There may be a reason for a husband and wife not to engage in sexual activity. I can see you might have a point there. But he uses the word perhaps. Perhaps there is. On the rare occasion... It's the exception, not the rule, I suppose. Not a regular thing, not like every week I'm just going to devote myself to fasting and prayer. Every week. Sorry. So if and when you do have a time of abstinence within your marriage... It should be for a mutually agreed reason and a mutually agreed time. Your body's not your own. I can't say that enough. After which time, have sex again. (laughs) And I know I'm making it seem very black and white, and I know there's a whole load of circumstances that can factor in. I'm very aware of that. Things that could be agreed upon, things that uh, you're praying about, things that happen in life can be so different and so varied, can't it? Maybe you've agreed that your wife should go on a a missions trip. She's away for six weeks. You've agreed it. There's obviously going to be no sexual intimacy. You've agreed it together. Maybe you are really weighed down by something heavy. Maybe you have a wayward child and you are desperately seeking the Lord or there is something that you want breakthrough in your life and you mutually agree together. 
to fast and to pray and to abstain. However, I would actually say that sexual intimacy strengthens your prayer life together and strengthens the, the bond. But maybe there are reasons, and I'm sure there are lots that you could think of as well. But the key to it is it's got to be an agreement. You can't just make the decision for yourself. There's got to be unity. This is how serious it is. One person doesn't call all the shots. It's submission, it's service, it's love, it's to be Christ-like. Sex life can be hindered for so many different things. I know that. There could be abuse in your past that has just left so much damage and understandably so and I don't intend to be flippant with this or make it sound easy at all but this is why communication is so absolutely essential maybe there's health concerns as I say there are a whole host of reasons but if you cultivate in your relationship if you're in a home that you are regularly pursuing your wife and uh, enjoying each other and having fun together and having, you know, dating each other and just enjoying being together and cultivating your relationship, you can talk about these things. You can work through these things. It's almost impossible for me to say what a time would look like because there are so many variants that could be factored into this. Romans 5. From verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God is so kind and so loving that even while we were his enemies, he sent his son. Christ died for us so that we could be saved, so that we could live, that we could be united with him. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. From the wife's perspective, again, from verse 3. reads like this, verse 3 and 4. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Is your banner over your spouse love? Real love. Because your heavenly father's banner over you is love. You will, if you are in Christ, you will one day feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb because of Jesus, the only begotten Son that was slain for you. So, to conclude, a regular healthy sex life in a Christ-centered, gospel-focused, servant-hearted marriage. In that covenant, it's essential. And it's vital to defend against the lusts of the flesh and the attacks of the enemy. It's almost like Paul's saying to prevent adultery, have regular sex within marriage but all under that relationship that you're cultivating. Proverbs 5, verse 15. 
Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Enjoy your own husband. Enjoy your own wife. And it might sound overly simplistic, but it makes sense in the context of what it does to me anyway and what we've looked at. There were people who were living incredibly sexually, liberally within the church. And others had taken an equally extreme opposite stance. Denying the flesh completely, even within marriage. Both are wrong. Both are sinful. Both are destructive. So this afternoon, if you're married, be married for the glory of God. Seek to represent him through the way that you love and you cherish your spouse. Work together for each other. Work together for God's glory in your unity. Have sex. Something I've never said from the front before. (laughs) Have sex. Have it regularly. Have it for the sake of the other person as an act of service. And I really hope and pray that this sermon will spark conversations in your home. I hope it sparks conversations between you. I hope it sparks more than that. (laughs) Perhaps it will lead to some of you repenting to your husbands for withholding. Perhaps it will lead to repentance from a husband who's been bullying or manipulative or domineering. I hope it does spark repentance if it's needed in your marriage. And I hope you can see how good sexual unity is. Whatever God has given you, use it. So if you're single, I know you might have been sat here thinking, not for me, this one. Be single for God's glory. There is no missing peace that a spouse will fill. Christ is enough. A spouse is a wonderful blessing and a joyous helper, but a pale imitation of a saviour. Christ alone your hope is found. And a discontent single could just as easily become a discontent married person. You must be content in Christ. So let's find our satisfaction in him. I pray, I pray that you'll seek to have a Christ-centered gospel-focused marriage that's healthy, that represents him, that shows the world what marriage really is. We need to defend. We need to fight for our marriage because it's under attack. It's under attack from the world. It's under attack from our sinful hearts. It's under attack from the enemy.